Good afternoon everyone in Blenheim. Tim Wardlaw here speaking from Hobart. Sorry I couldn't be with you. I'm talking about managing biotic risk today and the reason I'm not talking with you there today is because I'm managing my own biotic risk back in Hobart. So uh, I'm wired up to antibiotics and uh, getting rid of the little bug that got me a couple of weeks ago. Um, just uh, by way of introduction what I'll be uh, talking about today um, a very quick summary of uh, how we go about identifying the key biotic threats that uh, are going to threaten the uh, eucalypt plantation estate, how we manage those threats and how we can use the knowledge that we've gained from studying those biotic threats to make more informed decisions on species choice and hopefully that will be uh, useful information to guide the issues that you're facing in New Zealand with regards to some of the species choice decisions you're looking at. Um, I'll be mainly talking about Australia's plantation estate. Um, as I said in the uh, notes, um, the estate we're looking at in Australia is a very young estate. Most of it's less than 15 years old, barely through its first rotation and certainly for solid wood we've got uh, a long way to go before we get to the end of the rotation of the many of the trees we've planted. So the issues with rat, for that with regards to biotic risks is that some of our plantations haven't been exposed for the full period of time that biotic risks might be affecting them. And you can, um, I'll cover that a little bit more later, but uh, the other issue with regards to uh, that very young and expanding plantation estate is that the pests and pathogens affecting those move in um, in proportion with the increasing size of the plantation estate. And this is work Peter Grimbacker and co have done just looking at the relationship between the number of uh, insect pests found within the plantation estate over time as the area of that plantation estate increases. So we're finding more and more insect pests in the plantations as the plantation estate increases. Fortunately, most of those insects and the pathogens uh, don't cause a lot of problems. Just a small number do. One, um, there are a couple that I'll be looking at in a little bit more detail. One of the issues with relation to the young plantation estate and the fact that many of those plantations are being established in greenfield areas is that they don't have the full suite of pests and diseases present with them when the plantations are established and we start to see pests and diseases move in as the plantation estate matures. And this is a, a good example I'm showing here of such a thing with uh, Ganipterus in southwest of Western Australia. When the plantation estate was initially established in the early 1990s, Ganipterus wasn't present in Western Australia. It, uh, it did eventually arrive probably from Tasmania in the mid-90s and uh, for the first few years it slowly expanded its range until the range of sites it could occupy in the, the plantations that had been established became uh, fully occupied and it didn't start to stabilise until the early 2000s as you can see on this, uh, this graph with the darker shading where Ganitris has established and starting to cause some severe damage. Um, as time went on a lot of the plantation managers started to manage the, that particular pest and you can see that represented by the decline in the severity of Ganipterus damage over time as management started to take effect. Um, with relation to Ganipterus, it's worth mentioning that um, now managers aren't so concerned about this particular insect. A lot of the impacts that they thought were going to happen haven't transpired. So the growth losses are much, much less than predicted. And uh, in future, very few of these uh, outbreaks of Ganipterus in Western Australia would be managed. Um, Tasmania's plantation estate is quite a little bit different to a lot of the plantation estates elsewhere in Australia because it's a relatively mature estate and it's embedded <coughs> excuse me <coughs> it's embedded in a matrix of native forests and older plantations and uh, from the very early stages of that the rapid expansion in the early uh, in the early 2000s or late 90s um, the pests um, were pretty much occupied that whole estate and expressing themselves in a way they would had they been there as, as they'd been there for the whole time. Um, and we're looking here, this is Chrysometal leaf beetles. They're a native 
to Tasmania, widely distributed through our native estate and they've moved across to the plantations quite happily right from the very start of the, the plantation development. So we've got a whole suite of uh, pests and diseases we find in the plantations but only a relatively small number of them are going to cause us some severe problems and the challenge is to as quickly as possible identify what, the, what those key, when those key threats, what those key threats are, sorry. Um, and we do that by looking at the consequence of the damage. Um, the key drivers driving that is uh, the proportion of the crop that's affected, how much of the range occupied by the crop is going to be affected, the severity of the damage when it gets in there, and over time how many episodes of damaging events would you expect to see. Um, there are also things modifying the particular attributes of a pest and, or pathogens, the stage of the rotation affected, so a pest affecting the very early part of the plantation's life in its establishment phase will largely cause um, you know, losses in stocking, um, things like that. Very much different to um, a pest that will affect mid to late rotations, um, which could affect you know, several times for the life of the plantation, whereas an establishment pest really is only going to be affecting the year or, or t the year or so of the, the first year of the plantation's life. The part of the host affected, so defoliating pests tend to have a quite a much more moderated effect than, say, a pest or pathogen that uh, affects the growing tips and causes shoot dieback, which affects the form of the tree. Similarly, a pest that uh, will kill the tree is going to have a much greater impact than a pest that's going to cause defoliation from which the tree can recover. Um, the season in which the damage occurs can have a big impact. So pests that cause damage mainly in the early part of the growing season would have a relatively lower impact than a pest that caused damage in the later part of the growing season. And that all affects the speed of recovery. So with those attributes in mind, um, I've gone through and looked at, uh, just drawing on my experience, and uh, listed what I consider the key biotic threats to the eucalypt plantation estate in Australia. And and of interest to those in New Zealand. Um, I've divided those into establishment, the establishment phase, the young plantations and the mid to late rotation plantations. Uh, I'm not going to read through that list. Each of those pests are detailed in the proceedings associated with this uh, conference and uh, in more detail, I'll be covered in more detail within that. <coughs> Most of the pests um, are pests that have uh, evolved with the eucalypts um, and are closely associated with the eucalypts. Some are more generalist, so the establishment phase pests in particular, the, the uh, heteronchus um, and the browsing mammals are uh, pests which uh, have a very broad um, host range they'll feed on just about anything, particularly the, the, the heteronchus, the uh, African black beetle, is a pest of pasture species it's, uh, and it became a pest of the eucalypt plantations as they became planted in the plantations. But most of the other pests on that list uh, have evolved with the eucalypts and are closely associated with particular species. Having identified what the key biotic threats are, um, the challenge is to manage those and that, I guess that's the, the, the key criteria I use to identify the, the, the most significant biotic threats are those that, uh, that in the absence of management are going to threaten the viability of a plantation. So they've really got to be managed. So <coughs> a key challenge with uh, dealing with those significant threats is developing effective management practices to deal with them. The African black beetle, Heteronchus, um, that management proved remarkably easy. Just a, uh, a simple um, plastic mesh sleeve put on the seedlings had they planted to, to exclude the, uh, the beetles was enough to uh, basically eliminate that threat. Um, a similar sort of approach is used with browsing mammals but the majority of browsing mammal control is uh, by population reduction as you'd be uh, well familiar with it within New Zealand. So I'm not going to go through in a lot of detail with the remainder of those um, threats on how they're managed. Um, I've given full details in the notes associated with this talk that you can refer back to. Most of them are effectively managed. There are a few, however, that uh, management isn't sufficiently, effect sufficiently effective to um, mitigate the threat and uh, 
for several of them they are enough to threaten the viability of the plantation. So you'll be well familiar with Kiramaisis eucalypti in uh, New Zealand where it's, um, it's really threatened the viability of the uh, eucalyptus nitens plantations that are close to the uh, eastern seaboard of the North Island. Um, another Kiramaisis which only appeared in the last couple of years up in uh, the tropical area of uh, Queensland, Kiramaisis visitus, um, really basically uh, destroyed the vi financial viability of a, um, a hybrid plantation estate that had been established by elders there and they lost about uh, 10,000 hectares or thereabouts of plantation that was written off. And there were a couple of borers there too, um, again mainly affecting tropical species or subtropical species which yet aren't effectively managed. But the main thing is that for the key, the most of the key biotic threats we do have effective management strategies to enable us to, uh, to plant the susceptible species on most of the suitable, sites suitable for those species and where necessary manage the biotic threats. So I've looked at how we can manage individual biotic threats but really we're, we're interested in managing a, a uh, species choice decision for the plantations. What's, what species would be best to plant in certain areas? What's our best bet? And what role should we attribute to the biotic threats in influencing that decision? I'll just now spend most of the rest of the talk talking about a case study from Tasmania where we looked at uh, how biotic threats influence the species choice decision for eucalyptus, nitens and globulus plantations. Um, currently in Tasmania about 80% of our plantations are eucalyptus nitens, 20% globulus. Um, the reason for that obviously partly due to the cold hardiness of uh, eucalyptus nitens for our high altitude plantations but elsewhere it's preferred because of perceived better growth rates and form and it's more resistant to microsphela leaf disease which is very damaging on eucalyptus globulus. Mm -hmm. However for the purposes particularly for solid wood globulus has certain advantages in terms of wood properties. It has better pulp yield and density. Uh, it has superior strength and stiffness and hardness and it's also got more genetic variation so if you're looking at uh, it's good, it provides a much greater potential for genetic improvement than eucalyptus nitens. So really for most growers the decision is which species will be more profitable and the question for globulus and nitens is does the superior wood properties of eucalyptus globulus compensate for the risk of uh, microsphera leaf disease and the lower growth rates that are, that are attributed to globulus. Um, and how do those uh, um, risks affecting globulus um, change when we start to look at price premiums for the superior wood properties that globulus has um, and the impact that the pests and diseases have? Because you've got to remember that uh, whilst we talk about microsphera leaf disease affecting globulus, there are diseases which affect pests and diseases which affect nitens as well. So we have to look at the suite of pests and diseases which are likely to impact on both those species. Um, ignore the horrendogram. It's a pretty straightforward approach to, uh, to do this sort of analysis. Um, we look at the approach of the climatic analysis um, where within the, the estate globulus and nitens are grown, which part of that estate is suitable for growing either globulus or nitens. Bear in mind that globulus is not going to be suitable for planting in the high altitude areas. And within that part of the estate, what are the most prevalent health problems that are going to affect nitens and globulus? Um, establishing that from our health surveillance records, we can then rate those health, rank those health problems in terms of their importance for the species choice decision. And the, thing, the factors that are going to influence that are the strength of the association of that pest or pathogen with globulus or nitens, the area it occupies within the, 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 the plantation estate available for the species choice decision and particularly that part of the plantation estate that coincides with expectations of high yield. So having delineated, having identified those pests and pathogens most important for the species choice decision, we can then look at the plantation estate and start to delineate it into um, regions of a, that are geographically and climatically similar and have a similar suite of pests and pathogens. Um, having then done that, we can look at the impact 
of the pest, pest those, those pests and pathogens in those particular parts of the estate on the expectations of yield and calculate what um, price premiums that we need to achieve with globulus to overcome any differences in uh, um, value, any differences in yield due to the pests and pathogens. Um, the first part of the story, where, where can we make the species choice decision? This is the climatic envelope for the plantation estate, Euclid plantation estate and state forest in Tasmania. The um, plus signs are the Knighton plantations and the circles are the globulus plantations. And you can see the globulus plantations are confined to the warmer parts of the estate. We've got a boundary here of about a 1.8 degree Celsius mean minimum temperature of the coolest month as the lowest temperature that we consider safe to plant globulus. Some of the plantations are slightly below that, but nonetheless, most of them are above that. So the area available for the species choice decision is that part of the estate where we can grow both globulus and nighton. So that part that has uh, that falls above a, that minimum temperature threshold. So below that, we've only got we haven't got a species choice decision. We can only plant nightons. Above that, we do have the species choice decision where we can plant globulus and nightons. So looking at the um, health surveillance records collected over the last decade from those plantation states, we can start to see very clearly what our main pest and disease threats are and um, showing here the ranking of the, the top 15 or so of those pests. Um, by far and away, browsing mammals and chrysomatid leaf beetles are our most significant pest threats constituting more than 50% of our, all the records. The other important factor, that they, those records are taken across the whole plantation estate, so we're most interested in those pests and diseases which concentrate their effects in that part of the estate where we're going to make that species choice decision. And you can see there's a, there's a full spectrum from those uh, uh, most common pest and diseases as to where, what part of the estate they occupy. So there are some typified here by Michael Sorella that are very much concentrated in that part of the estate that is available for the species choice decision. Um, others, like chrysomatid leaf beetles, it's, um, most of the severe damage they cause is concentrated in that part of the estate where we can only plant nightens at the moment. And then there are some, like typified here by browsing mammals, that have their effect right across the plantation estate. The other aspect I talked about in the species choice decision was the strength of association of that particular pest with globulus or nitens. And looking at across at those, the um, um, frequency of those records with each of the species, um, we can see four that are strongly associated with uh, globulus and three which are strongly associated with nitens. Um, the remainder are neutral, so they affect both nitens and globulus equally. Very briefly, uh, I mentioned the pests and diseases most likely to be of most concern for the species choice decisions are those which have their effects in that part of the estate that had provides the highest expectation of future yields. So the darker the shading here, the greater the expectation that that particular part of the estate is going to provide large proportion of our yields. So we're less concerned about pests and diseases which occur in those parts of the estate that you know, we have low expectations for future yields. So taking those three things together, the distribution, the coincidence with the distribution of the pest and disease in the area available for the species choice, the strength of the association with either of the two eucalypt species and the coincidence with expectations of high yields, we can look at the suite of pests and diseases found within the plantation estate and rank those most important for the species choice decision, which is what's shown here. So we've got five, the top five species, uh, pests and diseases affecting the species choice decision uh, are shown. So Gonipterus, the, uh, the defoliator that we've talked about earlier in Western Australia, um, Microsphrilla leaf disease, both of those two um, preferentially attack globulus and then if I top the root rot, drought and copper deficiency are strongly, more strongly associated with eucalyptus nighton. So two of, the, 
two of the most important species, pet pests for the species choice decision are associated with globulus preferentially, the remainder with nitens. And we look at the distribution of those in relation to where in the plantation estate they occur, we can, set, we can start to delineate the plantation estate into different regions, as I talked about. Um, and in that area available for the species choice decision, we've been able to divide it into five regions that are similar sort of climates, have a similar spectrum of uh, pests and diseases, and are geographically proximate. So in three of those regions, um, the, pest, the pest and disease threats are primarily defoliators with the, which preferentially affect globulus, so Mycospirella and Gonipterus are the two threats there, um, are strongly associated with, uh, um, are mainly going to affect globulus. And the other two regions, the um, threats there are mainly affecting the roots um, and they're strongly associated with uh, eucalyptus nitens. So we've got two different groupings there, the um, regions where the threats are primarily concentrated in, on globulus and regions where the threats are primarily affecting nitens. And we can look at the impact on the growth of those particular pests and work out what differential of pricing we need to have to overcome the impacts of the particular pest and pathogen sufficient for um, globulus to be a better prospect than nitens. And you can see here looking at the, the three regions where um, the, we have Gonipterus and Mycospirella mainly affecting globulus um, to, for globulus to achieve a, a better financial result than nitens. Um, in the presence of uh, those two um, pests and diseases um, we need between, we're at about a, a 30 to 40 percent premium in pulpwood, together with a 10 to 20 percent premium for peeler logs, for veneer. For globulus, the value of the globulus logs to be sufficiently high to overcome the impact of those pests and diseases. Now, we know from uh, um, wood properties studies that uh, a 40 percent pulpwood price premium for globulus is achievable in the sort of market where we're starting to see uh, uh, price premiums being paid for high pulp yield. So the, the conditions of a price premium under which globulus would be a better prospect than uh, nitens in the presence of those two pests and pathogens is uh, quite plausible in the current environment. So um, we think we can certainly get the 40% pulpwood premium and a premium for the peeler log sufficient for globulus to be a better prospect even in the presence of those two, two um, threats. Looking at the other two biotic regions, the other two climatic regions where the, the threats were dominated by root diseases and um, nutritional disorders affecting nitens, um, there's the impact of uh, some photograph there of an early, uh, early mortality from root rot by Phytophthora affecting nitens plantations. That in itself isn't particularly uh, significant a threat to the viability, the financial viability of a nitens plantation. But what we have noticed is that plantations that suffered early mortality from Phytophthora in later years suffered high level of wind throw. And this suggested there was ongoing root damage from uh, chronic root infection. Ongoing, um, with, and um, typically that sort of ongoing root damage is associated with reduced growth rates. And just looking at some measurements from several plantations in northeastern Tasmania that did have early uh, Phytophthora mortality. We can see there that uh, the uh, site index of those plantations, on four, in four of the five of those, was considerably lower than we estimated based on those site qualities. And the sort of quantum of uh, reduction in site, site productivity in those plantations is a similar quantum to other root diseases reported in plantations elsewhere in the world. You know, 34, so a 30 to 40 percent reduction in site index of Knighton's plantations infected with uh, Phytophthora is plausible, but by no means demonstrated. So in looking at analysing the impact of Phytophthora, um, and remember, if you remember back, I'd, there were three biotic threats for night, differentially affecting Knighton's, Phytophthora, drought, 
and copper deficiency. We've eliminated copper deficiency from the analysis because we've been able to very effectively control that with fertilising at uh, establishment. So copper deficiency isn't really going to affect the viability of the night and plantations because it's effectively managed. But just going back to the main impact of Phytophthora here, its uh, effects are concentrated in the low quality, low quality sites. Um, only a small proportion of those, 20 to 30 percent of them, are currently infested with Phytophthora. Um, but if the number of sites in future expands, so more of the sites become infested, um, say to uh, Phytophthora spreads to 50 percent of those high quality sites, um, and we get a a 40% growth impact, that sort of plausible level, globulus is a better prospect than nitens. If it spreads to 100% of those high, low quality sites, and we only get a 20% impact, globulus is still better than nitens. Um, that's with the current price premium. If we get a 20% price premium for high pulp yield, um, Phytophthora, the, 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 the nitens plantations becomes even more sensitive to Phytophthora. So, um, we only need a 20% growth impact on 50% of the low quality sites for globulus to be better than nitens. Um, and only 10% if all the high, low quality sites become infected. Um, if you're looking at a 40% price premium for higher pulp yields, which is again the sort of price premium we think based on the, the variation that we're seeing in the plantation estate, then globulus is better than nitens regardless of Phytophthora impacts. So the two examples I've, I've gone through here, we've looked at the, um, just in summary for the species choice decision, we've been able to delineate the plantation estate, um, identify the, the key biotic threats and look under what situations the market um, prices for the wood products is going to be sufficient to overcome those threats. And, in each of those situations, um, we've got a better understanding of whether um, planting globulus, for example, in areas prone to Microsphrella is going to be a risky proposition when the market's likely to be paying, paying us a higher premium for those uh, globulus products. And so we've got a better understanding of what risk we have for planting globulus in areas where Microsphrella is. It's highlighted that um, areas where we've currently planted night and top three is an, an enormously important threat and the situations under which globulus becomes a better prospect than nightens is very much more, there are very much more likely to occur. So the sort of pr price premium we're seeing in the market price place makes globulus a much better prospect um, when you take into account Phytophthora impacts on nitens. So just in conclusion, what we've learned from our uh, decade or two of plantation expansion in Australia in relation to those biotic threats, um, we know that most of those significant threats were known to us prior to the, the plantation expansion, so there, there weren't too many surprises there. Um, most of those threats can be managed although some of the ones, particularly in the tropical areas, are a bit more challenging than those in the temperate areas. Um, we have uh, accumulated some good empirical knowledge about the biotic threats for some species, but that's just a relatively, for a very, relatively few plantation species, particularly for globulus and nightens, the two most widely planted species in southern Australia. We've got a reasonably good empirical knowledge of the biotic threats, so the impacts they have, the cost of management. And we can use that information, we've taken that information and we've used it usefully to uh, make more objective decisions on the species choice. So that's all I wanted to, I have time to cover today. There's plenty more issues that uh, I'd like to cover. Maybe next time we have this get together, we can discuss some of those. Thank you very much.